So, Raimondo, tell us about features of Lone Youth, how the work started. and uh, Well, it, it began, um, I think, well, it's inspired by a house I lived in, like a, a share house. I lived in in George Street, uh, which was kind of very decrepit. It had like um, we had floorboards missing and we had like, we had a couch, an old couch that we just sort of threw into a corner and covered the, the hole in the ground with. Um, and like there were about 13 people living in the house. So, um, and we, we didn't have a front door. So, <laughs> so anyone could just wander in any time. And so sometimes, you know, like we would hide in our rooms while they sort of just roamed around at night and we just locked the doors. So it was inspired by that really. Um, and then we all got thrown out because the owner came in and said, oh, we're, all, we're selling, so you're going to go. So it was kind of inspired by this idea of living together in a, in a place. But I was also politically inspired by the idea of a kind of creating a kind of proto-fascist environment. What would, it, what would it be like if, you know, simply a landlord could come in and just literally control everyone's lives? So I was trying to create a kind of a, a microcosm for a much bigger political idea, which was that that's the way I felt at that time that people were being kind of, you know, we had, you know, Kenneth closing schools and all that sort of thing going on. Well, I don't think he's anything like that, but, but at the time I felt like there was a, the potential for a kind of, um, uh, a, the rise of a kind of a, a much more extreme right wing, you know. Which it's is interesting that that's actually maybe what we're seeing now. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I've always sort of grown up with that kind of, you know, thinking anyway, because of my um, family's uh, background and what have you. And so um, I've always, always been steeped in kind of, you know, particularly European kind of politics, but also, you know, world politics really. I was very, very interested in what was going on in Africa and Latin America at the time in the 80s. We you know, had lots of you know, military governments and um, or dictatorships and there were coups and US inspired coups going on everywhere. So um, I was really interested in how that might play out or and, 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 and the power dynamics within a kind of a, a household mm. and sort of really sort of replicating some sort of social world but we're putting it into a kind of a, a share house. So the idea was I'm, while I'm replicating that bigger picture, I'm putting it into a context where it's just basically a bunch of young people having a lot of fun, you know, sex, drugs, everything. And, um, but then this person comes in and starts controlling that to his own advantage because, you know, at that time, rents were incredibly cheap. I mean, you can really... But, the, but a lot of people kind of like didn't want to buy, most of my friends didn't want to buy into the kind of world which we all have to now to survive, uh, and that is just being a wage slave. Mm. So, but what happens when you don't have that kind of future direction in your life? You don't really want to participate uh, in the kind of, you know, that, the, the, the way, of, the thing of getting a job, having a regular boring life. Um, what, do you, what do you actually do with your life? You know, what do you actually... Um, do apart from make art, how do you survive in that context? Um, so I was looking at the kind of mirroring that kind of 30s thing with Lumpen Proletariat are basically control, you know, come in and they just go right, you know. Um, so that's that that was the kind of inspiration for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it to some extent it feels like it captures a Melbourne that we don't have anymore. Were you conscious about uh, you know enshrining that or sort of taking that moment of time in, in the play? Yeah, I mean, I was kind of writing it for uh, what I, an imagined future, um, but I didn't imagine we would all be as quite as, you know, I mean, as middle class and wealthy as we have become because of, you know, house prices and everything else going up. And, but, I, but having said that, I mean, there are a whole bunch of people who are completely disadvantaged and probably in a way a lot more disadvantaged than what people were then because then it, most people could at least form, uh, afford a roof over their head, which people can't do now. So the homelessness issue was, I mean, you never saw beggars in the street, you know, in the, in, in the late 80s. And that play, I wrote that when I was 24, and so that's nine, what is that, 94. I mean, you didn't see beggars in the street, you know. I was paying, my first time, paying $10 a week rent. So you could afford, I mean, that's, I was on $120 at Oz study, you know, and paying, that actually, by the time I was on Australia, I was paying 20 bucks a week. So, you know, like, that's one-sixth of my wage going into rent as opposed to what it would be now. So, um, what I couldn't envisage, of course, is, is the fact that, you know, we've, we've, we've become um, a lot more, I guess, 
we're not as radical as we are we were in the sense that like a lot of my friends were kind of anarchist or they were they had kind of very utopian ideas about what, what we could all do with our lives and the way society might function and I think we've, most people have shed those because the harsh reality is that you know there's we've been overtaken by you know corporations or whatever but like um, you know I, I but at the same time, what, what I really like about that play still is that it, it, it essentially focuses on these individual lives and puts them into a kind of dramatic context. And essentially the play really is about those relationships more than anything. I mean, the politics is something that sits there but you're not conscious of it when you watch it. Yeah. And how did the work begin for you? Do, you have, do you begin with images, with dialogue, with character? What's the process for those early works? Um, I always start with thinking about that, what, that, what these individual people are like. And so sometimes they're based on people I know, sometimes they're a composite of people I know or ima and imagine, or they're maybe a composite of lots of different people. Um, uh, you know, like um, the, 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 the strawberry guy, the, fact, the, the fascist guy comes in was based on a kind of local thug that I knew, <laughs> that he used to wear, everyone knew, you know, not that he wasn't a friend of mine, but he used to sort of roam around the place and. Uh, he was a drug dealer, um, uh, and so and but the others were not really based on any one, anyone I knew, but they were kind of like um, versions of people that I knew around the you know this sort of scene I was in, um, and um, so I start with really focusing on them and the, and the kind of things that they want, like what is it they really want from each other, and um, but I don't really go into kind of deep psychology about it. I just I just sort of, I try to be quite spontaneous when I'm writing, mm. so, um, but I do focus at least with a scene, I put two people together, I do focus on something they want deeply from each other, but I don't try to specify what it is, I just try to locate what it is in, in myself, and then I let them speak, and then it just comes out how it comes out, and then I kind of spend, a, I sort of write very quickly, like I'll write a scene usually in one sitting, and then I'll spend a long time rewriting and rewriting and rewriting, uh, I also plan structurally when I'm like well, where they're all going, you know. So I find out an end point for each each character. So that's kind of the way I write. So it's more like I, 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 I'm sort of starting here, and then I end it, have an end point, and then I just somehow let them get there. But I don't do it consciously. I just go, okay, eventually they've got to get here. Yeah. Sometimes they don't get there, but that's fine. At least it gives them a, a direction. It gives them a kind of a, a something dragging them towards it. Um, and sometimes I don't think of length. I just write, and it just it just comes out the way it comes out. So sometimes scenes are really short. Sometimes yeah. they're long. Um, but afterwards, I do structure it. I think, okay, it's too it's too much weight here in the front. You know, I need to spread that out a bit. And so I, I do smooth things out. Yeah. But I don't like it when people are conscious of the structure. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And you and you had two essentially premiere productions within, you know, quite a quick span of each other. What was that like to be able to to sort of see? You know, the the Rantis production and then and then Benedict's production for Magpie. Well, it's fun. I mean, it's always fun. You know, I mean, I've I've never really. I, one thing I try to do is I don't hold on to my version of what things is what things are. Like I think that's really important when generating the material, but it's also very important to let that go. And I always say to writers, you know, what I when I'm you know teaching writers is to go is to say, you know, the the director's job is not to replicate your imagination. <laughs> you know, like what they have to do is make something out of this material and claim it for themselves. And they have their own vision. And really a good player can spit any vision, really. Um, now, so, so I, I didn't really have much conversation with Benedict Andrews, actually. Uh, he, I knew he wanted to do the play, um, but we, have a, we had a very particular process we were working with, with Rand, is like we rehearsed for 12 weeks. Um, we had the festival money, we produced it in this, um, well, it wasn't a performance space, it was the power station. So we spent a bit of money kind of making that into a space that was kind of acoustically okay and warm. Uh, and, um, and, you know, um, the Benedict benefited from some editing that I did during the run, but I didn't give the actors in our version. So our version was a little bit longer. And I just felt, okay, it's a little bit, of, it's a little bit long, you know, like there's some stuff that drags and it's like a bit monotonous there, so I'll cut it. So he got the benefit of having a cleaner script, a tighter script. Um, but they were very, very different productions. Yeah, so it was it's always really interesting to see that. And I actually don't really form an opinion about one being better or the other. I just like seeing people 
make a go of it and claim, claim things for themselves. Yeah. And it's still sadly a rare opportunity for an Australian playwright to see to see multiple productions. I was struck reading it again too that um, I'm you know there's some elements to me that resonate with the kind of in your face work that was happening in you know and Anthony Nielsen and uh, Kane and those kind of people shopping and fucking Mark Ravenhill's work that uh, that the work was seen as provocative in in an empty sense, but it actually was about you know, a claim to talking about the world as it was yeah. and to want to kind of shake people awake. Is that something that you, you know, were conscious of or were aware of in terms of the movement at Melbourne at the time, that sort of social well, aspect of the work? Well, I was aware of the desire to want to have that effect on your audience and that was certainly my intention, but I wasn't aware of any, aware of any kind of worldwide phenomenon, and certainly yeah. not the British. I mean, it's interesting, Shopping and Fucking was on at the same festival uh, so um, Max Stafford Clark's, uh, yeah. I think it was out of joint. Yeah. His production came toured, so it was actually coincided. So a lot of the actors, all I think five of the actors came to see our show and stuff. And we had a, you know hung out for a bit, and um, uh, but um, I wasn't aware of his writing, or I wasn't aware of Sarah Kane's writing, mm. or anything like. It's that. It's just a really interesting kind of uh, zeitgeist, almost. Of yeah. you know, but that happens a lot. Works, you know, yeah. That happens a lot. I think you know. I've, like it's just people are tapping into something that's critical at that moment in time. And um, uh, I mean, interestingly, uh, Clifford Hawkins Festival still has, uh, in real terms, a box office record. I think it has for the Melbourne Festival. So his whole agenda was to go and get young people into the theatre, you know, bring them into the theatre, because then that demographic's being ignored and he wanted to appeal. So he had the Gurgitator, the, the, the Regurgitator, I was going to call him the Gurg. The Gurg. <laughs> the Gurgitator and um, Handspan did a co-pro and we had our show and then Shopping and Fuckies. So they had all these um, productions on for younger people. And, I mean, we sold our show out, like, very, very quickly. Like, it was just, you know, 200 people a night, bang, gone, very quickly. Like, the season was, was, was sold out within a few, yeah. like, before it had opened, yeah. There's that phrase, I think, for the in-your-face generation about being kind of Thatcher's children. What, what do you see features as kind of tracing out of the 80s and your experience of kind of being a refugee, essentially, to Melbourne from, from Tassie? And... Um, well, I kind of... It was, it was very much about young people coming together um, and gravitating uh, and trying to find a kind of an alternative lifestyle completely. And like, that's what I mean. There was, wasn't like how we integrate or how we didn't have ambition to be part of a kind of mainstream world at all. It was like, no, we wanted to create a, a, our own way of living. But of course, I mean, it's dependent on welfare and a whole bunch of other things. Um, but it's, you know, when you're 20 years old, I mean, you just don't think about anything and you just want to live that life. And it was pretty amazing, you know, yeah. like when I think back, just how free life was, you know, for at least I lived like that for like a good five years, you know. Uh, well, until I got into drama school, really, actually, was when I was 22, I think, when I got into drama school. But, but you know, like it, it, was, it, it, it was, it didn't have the anxiety that is around now where people are so conscious of having to, you know, what is my, what's my career, you know, pathway um, you know, how am I going to afford to be a writer? I mean, they're not questions I ever even asked myself at all. I said, I wanted to, I am an artist. I want to be an artist. I'm going to live like one. It wasn't like, where do I get the money from? I mean, it just, <laughs> it just didn't, it wasn't a consideration at all. And so what's kind of freeing about that is that I didn't write plays that were commercially viable. I just wrote plays the way I wanted to write them. And I think actually that's the key anyway. Yeah. Like I, I do, I think you need to be true to what your vision is. Um, and um, there's a lot more competition now, though. You know, there's a lot of a lot of people more write, a lot more people writing. So, <laughs> and, and are there any obsessions uh, 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 from that play that you that you still feel like you're kind of grappling with? Things that you trace through the whole of your career? Yeah, I mean, I th it, it is the thing of being idealistic and being true to that, like right? being true to that kind of that very inner core desire to be yourself and not to compromise, you know, and that's something I'm, I find interesting about most people that I know, but also certainly they're the kind of characters that I write. They're not people who are, who are, who are interested in, 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 in compromise at all, mostly. You know, and I think, um, so it's quite a romantic kind of um, vision, really. And the writers that I read are tend, to, tend to be like that as well. Like, it's quite hopeful too. Yeah, well, absolutely, because I do think you can change the world in the way you want to. You know, we, we shouldn't be cynical, you know, and I find that as, I, as you get older, a lot of my friends become very cynical and they become 
kind of like, they just sort of give up on a lot of those kind of dreams and ideals. And I just think, no, what for? I mean, first of all, that's what keeps you interested in life. Um, but also I have children now, and so I just try to instill those same values where you, 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 um, you need to be really positive and, and um, excited by what life can present. And um, so, the, so the characters I write about are like that, and they're, but they're also often politically driven. Um, desire, like, you know, like the way desire manifests in, in different people is also something that I'm interested in. Mm. And um, I guess trying to find what's exciting in the ordinary. You know, I think it's one thing to have, you know, like a, the, the big grand vision, but it's in practical terms, how do we live that? in our everyday life and I think that's what I try to uh, try to write about a lot yeah and what does that what does putting that all through the lens of the theater kind of get you yeah that's really fascinating and and, and the play is still performed you know it's been quite successful I suppose I'm really interested in I mean obviously it's about ranters as well but you had quite a lot of international connection success early on and that's always been a focus of sort of the work that you've done how did that come about and and you know, how important was that to your career? Well, it's been very important to my career because I think that the, the company would have folded. I don't, I, we've had consistent support from the funding agencies and I think that a lot of that is to do with the fact that, yes, we're getting a big audience here, but we're, we're touring every single show we do. So um, basically what happened was I put on um, one of my roulette plays, Borneo. Uh, we did it at the Adelaide Festival, but we presented it not within the festival. In, this is 1998. We presented it in a garage somewhere. And we had a, a couple of German presenters come and see it. Um, and they went, Ray, we, really, we love this. You know, can, we, can we bring it to Berlin? And we said, well, actually, we've got this other show called Features of the Blind Youth. We want to tour that. So they bought that. And that was on at the Theater der Welt in 99 in Berlin at the Hallisches and Ufa performance space, which was old, the Peter Stein's old um, theatre. And um, it was on the same program as Richard Maxwell's House, and um, so we, that was our first kind of foray into international touring and then we toured Roulette and we toured St Kilda Tales and just from there. Um, and then our work became more increasingly rarefied and more um, aesthetically clear in terms of our, our kind of ultimate, you know, something was kind of more of a unique kind of house style and that came along particularly with um, the Roulette plays but particularly with Holiday which, uh, and, the, and the subsequent works. And what was the response to that work as a snapshot of an Australia or a snapshot of Melbourne? Features. Well, it, it was interesting because, um, well, first of all, they decided, the Germans decided not to have subtitles because they felt like, you know, well, their audience in Berlin were uh, very literate and they can sort of yeah, speak English, <laughs> which is fine, but they, they couldn't understand the Australian accent. You know? So it was like they were all going, I can't understand a word of it. So that was interesting. Um, it did really well. I mean, it was, um, I think, not quite what they were expecting, really. Uh, you know, um, because they, they, they were, you know, like a lot of the presenters are come and seen Cloud Street and things like that, you know, Neil's version of Cloud Street back then. And so they weren't quite expecting that Australia would produce that kind of work because it's not their image of Australia. Their image of Australia is kind of either like we're either, you know, all living in the country and we've got, you know, literally, you know, animal, uh, native animals roaming around. Or are a very, very, very middle class and hyper wealthy because we've got a high GDP. They all assume we're like uh, Switzerland, you know. So this idea of the kind of world it presented in in that play was not something they were expecting. Yeah. yeah. And do you think that presentation or that interest in that uh, that class or that that group of people, that experience of people, has waned in Australian theatre? Well, political theatre, anything that has any kind of political bent to it has, uh, to a degree. I mean, but then there's been a bit of a revival in that recently, um, with much more around identity politics. But that's that that has really become very much to the fore in the last sort of five years. Mm. Um, when you're talking about class, um, there's very few writers that write about class, and I don't either, really. I mean, um, I, my plays, I try to just. I'm just interested in people, so I try to put all kinds of people into them. But I don't focus on working class people in the way, say, say Patricia Cornelius would or, or other writers. But, um, yeah, there doesn't seem to be an interest in uh, theatre companies, first of all, in producing those works at all. I mean, they just simply don't... They're not interested. So it makes it very difficult for those kind of writers to actually get a, get a play on in a main stage uh, theatre context. Mm. Uh, and the other thing is that the, the traditional audience is not really from... 
you know, from, from the working class. Or, so, and then you've got other problems in Australia, in the sense, not problems, but you've got other complications in the sense that, you know, uh, different ethnicities coming from different class backgrounds and rural backgrounds. And so how you bring all these people into an environment, into one space to watch a piece of theatre, is it raises a lot of, you know, interesting questions, yeah. you know. And I'm not sure we can have a kind of homogenous style of work that, that actually appeals to a wide... Yeah. wide base you know I think it's also particularly Australian to kind of resist homo- you know homogenization to sort of don't don't you tell me how this is somewhere mm. else that's strange um, yeah that British habit of going to the theatre to sort of take the temperature of the nation we, we don't quite have that habit we don't know what our nation is you know like we still haven't dealt with you know uh, Aboriginal sovereignty or all this sort of stuff I mean so with so many things we're not dealing with I mean we're really just sort of going okay we're we're a, we're a colony we just keep doing kind of that so you know, it's, it, I still see theatres as being quite colonial in the way they work and function. They're not really going, OK, well, what, who are we as a, as a city? Like, what is Melbourne as a city? I mean, we have the second most multicultural city in the world, for one thing. Like, how do our theatres actually grapple with that? Like, as, you know, they don't. I mean, we're still appealing to the same kinds of people that they always have. Yeah, the audience you know. looks the same. The, yeah, yeah. Not, it's, not, it's just not a question that's really... Asked. I mean, we're trying to deal... Now, at the moment, there's a thing around gender parity, but when we're talking about cultural parity, it's not even... We haven't even begun the conversation. Yeah, next stages. Yeah, so it's... Yeah. <laughs> so, which is quite extraordinary, really. But I, I, I don't... I mean, I just think, well, that's it. You know, like, don't... I mean, you know, there's always something to complain about. Yeah. But um, I, I just think you just write it, just do it, just keep doing it, and then, and then things do change eventually, you know. Don't... The last thing you want to do is go, oh, it's too hard. You know, I just, just keep doing the same damn thing. Yeah. You know, I think features is, you can put it on now, it's still relevant. Oh, I definitely was like, where can I put this on? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's such a lovely mixture of a snapshot of something, you, you know, uh, it feels of its time, but it, it still speaks, mm. you know, to now and, and is weirdly, you know, just as, yeah, that, that, that sort of proto-fascist, uh, and that's strange on we, that strange disconnection or dislocation that seems to kind of really affect, yeah, particularly kind of, you know, not that I'm a young person anymore, but, um, yeah, it's really interesting work and ambitious and beautiful and... Yeah, thanks. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's not, I mean, it's pretty bleak as well. Like, yeah, yeah it's not, it's not, you know... But I like that it's not, it doesn't apologise for yeah. itself. It's not, it's not bleak for its own indulgence. It's... It's bleak as, as a sort of a logical end point of what it's exploring, you know. I wanted to create the effect that people were angry, like when they'd come out of there, they'd be angry yeah. and do something. Like I really wanted to make, I really wanted people to feel pissed off and, and reflect upon their own situation and go, yeah, I can, I want to change something, not walk away going, yeah, I feel good about myself. I feel, yeah, yeah I'm okay, I'm satisfied. I didn't want that. Yeah, no, it's not a reconfirmation of my nicely held yeah, values yeah, of like yeah. you know, pat pat. No. And also, I'm you know I wanted people to critique that kind of lifestyle as well. The thing of just taking for granted that you could just you know I mean back then it was everyone was on the dole or on our study and they're kind of like oh yeah whatever. And I actually wanted people to critique that because that you know I always felt that that's not yeah the kind of faux intellectualism. Of yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. And it's it's it has its use by date too. Like eventually they're going to clamp down, and then what are you going to do? So it was it was it was that thing of being being quite. I wanted people to to be active. When they when they when they saw the, the piece, so um, yeah, and also um, you know it was also fun. You know, <laughs> people have fun watching it. You know what I mean? But I mean, what was interesting? A lot of people felt they saw themselves reflected, like for the first time, not in cinema, but in theatre. You know, a lot of friends of mine or people I knew who hadn't really didn't really go to theatre. See, the other thing is things have changed. Like back in the nineties, people the younger people didn't really go to the theatre like they do now. You know, that's really something that's changed yeah. a lot in Melbourne. Thanks very much for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks for, yeah, 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 thanks for doing it. No worries.